Hey everyone, I was hoping to get this message put together sooner, but things like this unfortunately take time to set up. I just want to say that the acts of war against Ukraine break my heart, and I know as a prior service member myself that my thoughts and prayers go out to everyone who's fighting the fight that they really shouldn't have to. That being said, we have been working behind the scenes with all of our podcasts and podcast partners to put a fund together in order to pay for any refugee housing and other needs that go alongside that, like food, water, and any clothing needs. Internally, many podcasts in the Hospitality FM network have voluntarily given up sponsorship money in order to donate to the cause and are working on a unified message in order to spread throughout all of our podcasts. So this is me calling out to all of our property manager friends, industry experts, and anyone knowing of those providing lodging for Ukrainian refugees seeking safety. You can contact me directly at will, with one L, W-I-L, at slicktalkmedia.com. We have an internal document that is being updated in real time, so if anyone could share this message within your network, we'd greatly appreciate it. I'm also placing in the show notes a link to our GoFundMe and landing page for Rentals to Rescue. That's rentals.torescue.com, where we're putting funds together in order to, again, provide finances for any of these lodging and relocation needs. So thank you so much for tuning into this quick message. I hope you guys are all well and safe, as I know we have tons of listeners in Ukraine and other countries in, in Europe. So thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Good morning. We made it to another week. Happy day off, Michael Ross. <laughs> I know. Well, actually, those days are quite nice. Between like just hiding some eggs for the for the kids, you can just also work, right? Because the majority of the company doesn't work. So, <laughs> so it is is a nice day to just do some stuff still in between and uh, yeah. But of course, always making time for the podcast. Did uh, did I see one of your employees in your corner office overlooking the Krakow Square? Yeah, I just saw her post actually, and it was actually it's my office, it's my desk actually. So <laughs> no, we have amazing office. I do miss it. We we keep it open. Some people go there uh, because they just don't want to work from home or they don't have the, the mm. facilities. But uh, I do miss it there. Yeah, you gotta gotta admit it's nice to have. Some kind of spaces working from home is great for a little bit, but then it's like, okay, you gotta get get to that collaborative workspace. It's just that's why I got my studio where I'm sitting now. This is it 100 meters away from my house? So I still have all silence, not screaming, running kids, even though I love <laughs> to have them around me because they might watch again. But uh, it's not too bad in here. Awesome. Well, how's your guys' uh, Easter? Both good. Good. Same as same as Ross, just a little one running around picking up eggs, and he had a, he had a different. <laughs> and strategy. eat it by yourself, probably, right? It's, it's, he had a different strategy. You know, most kids <laughs> try and pick up all the eggs. Oliver would stop, pick up the egg, eat what's inside, and then. Get it back. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, that's a, that's a good. I hey, I I kind of like it. I kind I think it's a good one. You should definitely try it next time as an adult. Just start. Yeah. Too much Eating. sugar was a problem, though. It was... Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're even more active than before. Yeah, more highs and lows. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, um, this is a fun episode. We're talking about investing today. So investment, funding, all that good stuff. The recovery of travel, what it's going to take dollar-wise. Um, so I think the way we should do it, since that we have a startup of the week today, uh, we'll do the bid eruption report, and then we'll head into what's with the noise segue into us three, you know, chopping it up and talking all things funding. You guys ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah, the start of the week is Apaleo. Last week I had Muse, which is a channel, uh, sorry, a PMS. And they're really focusing on connectivity and make it as easy as possible to connect. And 
if you talk to any plane industries, okay, they often naming Apel, Apaleo and Amuse in one word as they're both really focusing on to make it easy to integrate. So it is fair to also mention this week Apaleo as a startup of the week, also because they raised investments. Uh, a few days ago, they raised four and a half million uh, funding. So they're really focusing on API driven property management uh, system. German company, so congrats to be the startup of the week. Um, I think next week I'm not looking into any PMS or more or less less technology because we had two uh, two PMSs in a row. Uh, but again, because also we had the episode today about fundraising, funding, and show me the money. That's why I want to mention Apaleo this week as startup of the week. So uh, congrats, guys. Second thing I want to mention is, of course, is the conference or things what is happening. Um, I'm happy to announce that on the 21st of April, so that's in uh, is it two and a half weeks from now. I will speak at the Skiff conference about loyalty and subscriptions. As my, some people knows, it's one of my favorite topics. I'm happy to speak in there. Uh, other speakers are TripAdvisor, uh, Marriott, uh, I think some airlines and stuff. So it's uh, going to be fun to speak about loyalty and subscriptions. So uh, you can watch me. You can buy tickets already. So on 21st of April, I will be on the Skiff conference. And uh, that's it for the bit of report of the day because I can't wait to discuss. Uh, uh, investments and funding and everything, but first we go to uh, Mr. Golden. Hello, hello. Uh, so this week is a bit of a call out on ourselves from the predictions at the beginning of the year where we expected a, a lot of mergers and acquisitions, but with the continued uh, amount of funding that's coming into the space, I think that's likely to delay the, the M&A activity. Uh, it doesn't mean it's gonna go away altogether, but if you can get funding and not have to merge or be acquired, uh, I would typically think most companies would, would go that route. So. Um, we were slightly wrong, at least in the first half of this year on the M&A activity ramping up, but the funding has kind of outpaced where we had expected it to be. And I think we can chalk that one up for, for why, but got a really exciting show today and, and talking about three brands that, uh, that we know quite well in the short term rental space, the part hotel. Um, really kind of fit the build of, of what we've talked a lot about on this show, building a brand for um, short-term rental apartment hotels. So with that, um, let's, let's kick off. Yeah. yeah. So what were the three brands that, um, that were receiving investment that you were talking about? It was the Guild... Mint House and Sextant. Sextant is out of Miami. They've got a a good bit of density in Miami and New Orleans. Mint House is out of New York. Uh, They took over a handful of Lyric buildings, but they they like to play more in the higher end space. And then the Guild is out of Texas and they play kind of in the the mass market or or maybe slightly higher. in lots of urban core locations. Um, I've stayed in units of each of these operators. They all do a really good job. Communications are smooth. Um, locations of, of buildings are, are great. And, you know, they, they survived the pandemic. And I think if you're able to show the books of surviving a pandemic and maybe even making money, then it's a no brainer to, to investors to, help you get to the next level during this next year of travel. It's Mm -hmm. prices are going to be increased. Like we talked about last week and Mm -hmm. um, you know, essentially their costs shouldn't go up. So margins should just increase. Well, I think Uh, also that 2020 fortification rental wasn't too bad, right? It was still, if you look at the hotel space was a disaster for the alternative recommendation vacation rental was not too bad. And there's, if you're looking at the projections and everything, what is coming this year, and next year, it seems to be pretty positive, right? You see the recovery there. You see, we talked about last week about pricing and everything. So 
I think the investors as well see the potential there. At the end, you might see some consolidation. There will be several brands. At the end, they will merge some stuff. So I think it's now just getting market share. I think some of them just want to be as quick as possible, become as successful as possible, because I know there will be some acquisitions probably in, in, in a few years from now, because otherwise there will be too many players in the same, in the same area. Yeah, I, I expected a lot more M&A activity coming out of COVID on the yeah. vendor side, especially. Quite frankly, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that it hasn't happened, but uh, I, I guess some more funding might have floated or, or vendors ended up doing all right. As you said, at least on the short term rental side, vendors, especially ones that play heavily in the traditional vacation rental markets, are probably having record years. So yeah. no sense in, in selling. It's really the people with super high exposures to urban operators. Uh, but that's also what's pretty interesting about this. You know, we had a merger acquisition with Picasso Turnkey a few weeks ago, uh, which theoretically, th those companies should both be firing on all cylinders this year and last year with, with the vacation rental markets. What's interesting is that the three that announced last week are all heavy urban operators. Yeah. And, and essentially all are running hotels. They're just able to probably flex their inventory to longer term stays or midterm stays and, and keep the, the doors open. My, uh, my question would be, I think... go ahead. Is it delayed for us? Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. okay. Um, no worries. Well, uh, so my question would be then how many of these kind of like vendors or other companies got onto the PP, uh, PPP loans uh, faster than the normal? Cause I think that definitely, whether it's investment funding or actual just uh, government assistance kind of funding, I think that could also take a good play. And I think you know might know this answer, uh, Golden. For the three, Mint House, The Guild, and Sextant, are they completely different operating models, like mass release compared to rev share compared to ownership slash? Like, how does that work with the three different ones? Are they all pretty much the same or are they they're pretty different? They were all master lease, and the majority of their properties have flipped to rev share. They okay. don't own any buildings, and yeah. from my knowledge, they're not continuing the master lease. They might still have a few that they held on to, but uh, I, I don't know that for sure. Gotcha. Okay. I do I just, know that everyone I, tried to, to switch to rev share, yeah. which I think ultimately what we learned during COVID is that it's it's better for the building anyway because. Mm -hmm go into default and you don't pay rent like stay Alfred or Domeo, it's better to have a rev share, you know, on a hundred dollars than not pay rent on anything. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think ultimately it's this, the same thing happened in like 2008, 2009, lots of master leases were happening in condo hotels or, or different various short term rental ish type of buildings. And then it went away and then people started saying, well, you know, what if we started just guaranteeing you money and then we'll take everything on top. And thus uh, the master lease uh, model started taking off and easy to grow inventory when you're paying market rate rent, right? Um, so it'll be interesting to see how much inventory both of these or all three of these companies can add uh, without having to spend millions of dollars a, a month on, on leases. Yeah. Well, Michael, you can see there's the day. To your knowledge, Michael, did anyone in the hotel side ever like guarantee revenue? Um, I think none of them. I think it's it's impossible to guarantee your revenue, especially now, but I think not, nobody did before, right? It's, if you're yeah. looking at bedroom, we charge the hotel some things only when it delivered them X numbers of revenue. Are we going to give a guarantee? I think you can't, right? That's that's that makes it difficult. It's interesting to see because the branch you mentioned is all focused on the US. And I think this whole trend now with, with everything we mentioned in previous episodes, doesn't matter if it's the, the live house or the mint or everything, it's really popular in the US. But if you're looking at Europe, it's it's still you just I think Americans more into this whole branding and everything. Uh, you can see, of course, the whole franchises concept uh, concepts. It's pretty popular yeah. in the US. I think Europeans are more conservative, they're just they say we'll do it by ourselves. We don't need any brand around it. And 
So you can see a, bit, a big difference in this space in, in, in Europe. Maybe yeah. that's why you don't see many investments in, in, in the European market for, for something similar. True. I mean, I think if you don't build the brand and you're reliant more on the OTAs, which is fine, uh, there are some big companies, urban operators. Altito is a good example, but Altito's never raised any money. Uh, so they've, they've been able to build a, a pretty reputable large brand without the, the big dollar signs behind it. There's a few others like Sweden uh, that are multi-regional. Um, but for the, for the most part, you're right. Like the, the big ones, like Sonder has expanded into lots of European markets. Um, and I, I don't know if the Guild or Sextant or Mintos plan on doing that. My guess is it's, it's more opportunistic versus strategic. I think Europeans are less sensitive for this, right? They just don't care so much, so much about a brand. You see, or well, if we're looking at you, Michael, you just you you are really committed to a few brands. Of course, you men, you mentioned Marriott, Delta, etc. Europeans are pretty easy. They are swapping from brand to brand. They don't care so much. They're less loyal than than I think than, than Americans. So I think there's a difference there. And if you're looking for alternative accommodation, you don't care who's managing this. I think you just um, <clears throat> so I think there's a different approach there. Then. To come back to the acquisition part, I think it's also maybe there are less acquisitions because some companies, I think they are afraid, right? They just, they had to fire quite some big numbers of their workforce. And then when you're spending millions in buying another company, this, you can see it will not be always appreciated. So I think also why companies sometimes just avoiding acquisitions, okay, we just not go into this area because it's also a negative image, right? They just, before you fire two or 300 people and then a few weeks later, you're just acquiring a competitor. You, you, I think that's also one of the reasons that the acquisitions numbers is quite low. I think as well what you said, there is so, there was some funding, not a lot in travel. I think I just read an article that went down, I think like over 40% less than the year before. So in 2020 it was 42% less uh, investments uh, if looking at the amount than in 2019. So of course you mentioned there was some help from governments and I think the, the you see most companies in, in travel, even though the big ones there were they had difficult times, so I think it wasn't the best time for them also to acquire. I think when recovery starts, I think maybe later this year, uh, you might see them because it's like it's there's a positive image again. People just in that case, they feel they see some some trust, they see some uh, revenue coming. I think there might be a moment you see some mergers or acquisitions. I think the reason why it didn't happen before is really because the, the, almost all of them they had to do layoffs, right? So it's it's difficult yeah. then to acquire companies spending millions. So I think it was one of the reasons as well, because of course, then you're losing image, it's not good for your brand. So must be more reasons connected than only than the, uh, um, than the, than the amount of what they had still left to, to spend. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you're waiting for the green sheets to show up and for COVID to be gone before you take the big bets and spend hmm. tens or hundreds of millions of dollars acquiring complementary or competitive companies make sense well i was yeah. expecting what maybe some more mergers for example or some brands is okay we're going to cope with closer because of recovery we might need each other harder than ever before so i was expecting maybe more strategic partnerships maybe with some brands and then of course a long time ago we mentioned maybe this is iag and uh um what was it starwood i guess we mentioned some some potential corporations it doesn't always have to be completely like a takeover yeah, but we were everybody was free under sim we work on Marriott, one of the predictions, but <laughs> we didn't see many of them. I think everybody was more trying to survive on their, uh, survive their own company. They didn't look too much outside, which surprised me because I think if you work together, you can come back stronger. But uh, I was expecting more kind of partnerships or maybe some mergers there, uh, maybe not particularly acquisitions, but um, they were not there as I, as I was expecting them, even maybe in technology partners or some of them or vendors, what you said. So. We might yeah. see them later. I think it's it's keeping calm. People are waiting now. When I see some recovery, when everything starts to be kind of positive again, I think then the people are willing to make a move. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I again, I think on the vendor side, at least in the short terminal space, I, I don't know the hotel landscape that well, but it's frothy, and I didn't see too many companies kind of close their doors and go away. So. We'll see what happens after the pandemic. If, like Will said, the PPP or what was it? Yeah, PPP. 
Yeah, PvP. Help those. Keep people afloat uh, for for long enough to get through, or they just help keep people people keep afloat for a little bit longer, and and then they get in desperation mode for selling or, or shuttering the doors. So yeah, well, there's now been this question, right? Do they get new funding from the government? Do they get new? Because of course they get around a year ago, they might get some help. Now it's like one year later, everybody's predicting, okay, next year gonna be better. Now we're still in many countries in lockdown. Yes, vaccinations have started, but still recovery yeah. didn't really uh, started so far. So what's, what's interesting is without conferences, like you don't hear the rumors quite as much, right? Like typically, there there would have been a few conferences in March, April, and, and we'd be able to <laughs> we'd be able to call the predictions pretty easily because we know what's actually going on. But it's a it's a bit in the dark this year. I don't know if you feel the same, Michael. Uh, yeah, no, but one. it's the same. If you look at the investments we got, the majority of the people who invested are in a company. We met them in person, right? And still behind the camera, it's always it's about trust. It's about the major, the main reason to invest in a company, it's still the entrepreneurs. Well, it's still different when you meet somebody in person or see somebody behind a camera. So I think still that's why as well, maybe really big transaction. There were some, of course, but I think the really big transaction or acquisitions didn't really happen because they sometimes they, those conversations starting often uh, after working times, right? With the beer and stuff, like how is your business doing and stuff. And, and if you look also at our our company, some of them they just invested because an informal chat. It started as an informal chat, and if you go to the focus white conferences again or the, the skiff conference and all those things, you're just meeting so many people. And then I think that's also one of the reasons that those like the not surprised kind of investments or, or acquisitions really pop up. The other hand, you see the interest. You can see also in our company, and we're looking at all possibilities. There were some acquisition possibilities or discussions as well, and in, in, in also in, in uh, investments, quite some. So we are more popular than before, which is good. But you also see that there's, um, they're looking. Okay, what is really they're looking at the future? Okay, what is your projection for the future? Not really. They're not looking back a lot because, of course, the last year was completely different. So, but you can see the interest is starting again. You can see it's moving. You can see the the venture capital funds they're like looking more positive than than a year ago so i see there will yeah. some things will happen just say it takes i think the, the conversation starting now with many of them as people see around summer there should be some recovery starting so i think soon after summer i think you will see some some bigger rounds some more investments coming because even the, if you look at the funds who are investing in travel the tayer ventures house so they did maybe two or three investments last year which is a really small number right for for funds which is investing in travel yeah i think the couple points that you made there one like i was at focus right got three years ago maybe and the ceo of turnkey the ceo of wyndham and the ceo of vacasa were all gathering having drinks after hours and sure enough they're all one company now right like it's and it takes years to to complete acquisitions and to you know kind of break the ice and get uh, people interested or intrigued by the opportunity. And then to your point, Michael, I don't necessarily agree that they just write off 2020. I think part of it is what changed in the market and does this company fit the new, the new norm, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why these three apart hotel companies helps, it helps them get funding. Like we, we survived. Our occupancy rates, hotel occupancy rates, let's mm -hmm. say green, right? So if we can survive the pandemic, guess what? The the biggest hurdle for people staying in short-term rentals in the past was doing it for the first time, was was leaving their branded hotel, their loyalty travel company, and trying out this new type new type of travel. When when uh, Focus Ride has done studies in the past, like maybe 33% of people who travel have even ever stayed in a short-term rental. Mm. But that number has climbed to north of 40% this year, right? So a 7% increase in, in total travel demand is pretty monstrous when you talk about, uh, you know, some hotels have gone out of business. Some of their competitors, Stay Alfred and Domeo have, have gone away. So I, I think, and to, to piggyback on, what we've talked about on the show many times, like apart hotels are the future of travel. It's flexible. You know, when travel demands ebb and flow, 
you can turn on more units in a multifamily building, or you can swap them back to long-term rentals and you don't have these giant boxes sitting vacant. Uh, and hotels did a great job of, of being as nimble as possible, adding fitness studios or, you know, recording work, studios, working recording studios or, or offices, many offices. Yeah. Um, so I think that was a good exercise, but at the end of the day, um, you know, short-term rentals were better occupied. And, and I think because of the market shift there, it's, it's probably easier to get funding from the short-term rental side than it is from the hotel side right now. I think it's two sides. First of all, it's a trend, right? If you're as a VC fund, of course, when you're doing okay, for, often you have defer, uh, s- several options. So if, if you as a venture capital fund missing the opportunity because the, the, the company choosing for another one, you might look maybe at other possibilities, right? So the NDC in effect is well like a domino effect, like, okay, if there's one get investment and the other are also pretty similar, they do have kind of the same, maybe kind of grow numbers, et cetera. You can see like an effect, okay, then you might invest in the other one. So I think you see some effect there as well. And then what you said, indeed, if you as a company can adopt to the situation, I think it's really important when they see, okay, in a crisis like this, what did the company do actually to still have a growth or just have good numbers or... Uh, made a difference well, because they can come back stronger, whatever. It also makes sense. But right? we see it, as I mentioned, in our company because we have a different revenue model. You can see now, of course, you see the TripAdvisor and other ones you're seeing following our business model, which which is good. So it also gives people seeing this. It's okay. Subscriptions are going to be a new thing. This is something what might be interesting to invest in. So you can see trends are really important. And if you see a trend investing, you saw this some two, a few years ago when you saw the big transaction of Amadeus in TravelClick, when they acquired TravelClick, what is it for two billion or something, the interest and the valuation of all the channel managers that went up and everything. So because, okay, we are, maybe we are half the size of TravelClick. If you look at the numbers of properties, so up, uh, the valuations went up. So you can see there was, there, there's a lot of trends there. So I think if there's few acquisitions going on or investments going on in a specific area, you saw it in streaming and events and stuff, you saw them there. So at the end, we see some, maybe you see some in investments in different kind of areas within travel. You might see the follow-ups again, there again. Well, I guess uh, the question is, what's the prediction for this other half of the year coming up or the second quarter um, for you know funding or acquisition merger? Uh, we, we did a prediction at the beginning of the year. And like Michael said, uh, I, don't, I don't think we're a little, little off on the, the merger and acquisition side, but didn't focus on the funding. So now what, where do you guys stand? What do you think is the, the next step? Yeah, I think funding is, is probably a trend that's going to continue on. People are sitting on so much dry powder, as, as Michael alluded to. There's firms that are typically doing 10 or 12 transactions a year, only did three or four. Um, so they're sitting on dry powder waiting for, for the right conditions. Mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of the maybe desperate deals are gone from March, April, May of last year. So the valuations are, are going to be a little bit healthier for, for all of the startups. Uh, I still think mergers and acquisitions will happen at some point. Um, I also mentioned it on the show a few weeks ago, but I think Vacasa is going to go public later yeah. this year, which will, again, to Michael's point, like, when a, a company like that goes public, then valuations of others behind it increase, and mm-hmm. and there's a clear exit route, uh, and the markets, the markets will probably accept Vicasa quite well because their revenue numbers this year are going to be insane, uh, especially adding in turnkeys inventory, putting them, I don't know, twenty five, thirty thousand properties. Yeah, I agree. What's your thoughts, Ross? Yeah, I think what Michael said, the love in uh, venture capital, they are, they're kept some, uh, they kept some because they might have to reinvest in a portfolio company. Saw a few of them, of course, you saw that the, they are thinking they didn't beekeeper. So you see the few, there's okay, we need another, they invested 45 and then 2020, they invest another 10 because it was needed. So you can see, I think they kept something. I think it will start again. And if we do another pro- another prediction, and it might be shocking, but I think 
that in the Airbnb might go into subscriptions. I will not be surprised. And I think it will be, I just want to mention this before they do. I will not be surprised <laughs> because they're, they're charging on two sides, right? If this is going to happen, okay, I won't just be the, the new group, but they're charging on two sides, right? In some countries like Netherlands is officially not allowed there's some lawsuits, but they're charging the host and the, and the guest. It really makes a lot of sense to create loyalty for the guests. So if an Airbnb, and if they want to have some advice, they can, they can phone me, uh, will be high hourly hour, but no kidding. But that really <laughs> makes sense in my opinion, because if they want to create some loyalty with their with their travelers, right? They, in this case, they they charge them per booking as well. And you say, okay, we still monetize the other side as well to really protect our uh, to protect our brand and make sure they maybe have some benefits or free can say whatever. I think it will be really s s clever move of Airbnb to go into this direction to to monetize or just in that case so subscription model as well as it's really become really popular for travelers to do the same uh, and of course the host still based on on other fees they probably they will never stop with this but i think it will be if i can do a prediction i will not be surprised if airbnb goes in this direction I also notice that if they can convert a lot of people into a subscription because people are quite loyal to airbnb if you're looking at valuation wise and everything, even though they don't care so much anymore about valuation because they're IPO, but still, if you're looking at the projections and they know, for example, we have 2 million paying uh, users who's paying whatever X amount per year, it's, it's really good for company results and, and projections. So I will not be surprised if this goes into more companies go into subscription to really boost the valuation with help, of course, in, in, and that will might also maybe not help in acquisitions right because in that case the valuation goes sky high sometimes in subscriptions but if i do a production i will not be surprised if an airbnb goes into uh, subscriptions as well yeah i what will do you, think, Michael, do you think it will happen uh we'll talk about it off air <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I know oh well, i just know i know chip Connolly mentioned that they were working on a customer loyalty program for airbnb like a while ago step one right like yeah you have, you have to build a loyalty program first and then the loyalty program yeah. but this is where this is where i struggle with it there's a lot of professional vacation rental managers there's a lot of hotels going onto the platform and there's a lot of individual homeowners that just own a small unit or either a whole home nothing you know whatever the smaller type uh, inventory and that creating a loyalty program with individual non-brands that own one-off properties. I just, I find it hard to do. I think they're going to have a one heck of a challenge. And I think if they go into that model where they, they're going to create a loyalty program, which means guests are going to get discounts. The host has to get uh, compensated somehow. They're not going to, I'm not going to increase my rate 20% just so that way Airbnb can, you know, give it away at, at a discounted rate of, you know, 25 or 30%. Um, so I feel like it's going to be a one one hell of a challenge, uh, and I would be so I would not be surprised if there's a big host or property manager exodus of Airbnb and going to another OTA to find that replacement um, of lost revenue. That's just my thought. I mean, of course, they're going to have to compensate the hosts. They they yeah. wouldn't roll it out if they they weren't going to be paying hosts for free stays. Um, it's no different than, I mean, Marriott pays the hotels when points are redeemed. But not a lot. Like, uh, not a lot. <laughs> no? Yeah. No. Okay, I don't, I don't <laughs> know how it works. Well, they, 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 pay, they, they pay them out. It's, tra it's like a transferred currency in a sense. Like, you, you have, uh, you know, enough points for two free nights at a courtyard while Marriott's paying the courtyard property, like, $35 a night, maybe. So it's like very bare minimum compared to the $110 they would have gotten for a normal yeah. stay. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, hosts would revolt against that if, if yeah. it was going to be a 70% discount. Yeah. So, so, we'll see. We'll see. so I don't think it will be discounted. It's more to than in that case because nobody really charging the, the traveler right for it, for every, for every booking a booking fee. They're just waiving the booking fee. Amazon prime model as, as they are. I just skipped, uh, yeah. uh, mentioned us was the Amazon Prime of the uh, of this Amazon Prime of the hotel industry that might become the Amazon Prime of the uh, vacation rental. Who knows? Stay five, yeah. stay five times a year and then don't pay the guest fee anymore. Yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah I would not be surprised. Make, it makes yeah. for me a lot of sense. But they're listening and they're doing this direction. Just uh, I think we uh, <laughs> we earn some kudos. Credit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. One percent every year. That'd be great.
<laughs> we'll be fine. Uh, awesome. Well, thanks, guys. We'll see you guys uh, again next week. And I'm excited for more of our predictions to come to life. Great. Bye-bye.